Section 11 of The Valley of the Moon by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 11. The horses, resting frequently and lathered by the work, had climbed the steep grade to the old road of Moraga Valley, and on the divide of the Contra Costa Hills, the way descended sharply through the green and sunny stillness of Redwood Canyon. Say, ain't it swell, Billy queried, with a wave of his hand, indicating the circled tree groups, the trickle of unseen water, and the summer hum of bees. I love it, Saxon affirmed. It makes me want to live in the country. I never have. Me too, Saxon. I've never lived in the country in my life, and all my folks was country folks. No cities, then. Everybody lived in the country. I guess you're right, he nodded. They just had to live in the country. There was no brake on the light carriage, and Billy became absorbed in managing his team down the steep, winding road. Saxon leaned back, eyes closed, with a feeling of ineffable rest. Time and again he shot glances at her closed eyes. What's the matter, he asked finally in mild alarm. You ain't sick. It's so beautiful I'm afraid to look, she answered. It's so brave it hurts. Brave? Now that's funny. Isn't it? But it just makes me feel that way. It's brave. Now the houses and streets and things in the city aren't brave. But this is. I don't know why. It just is. By golly, I think you're right, he exclaimed. It strikes me that way, now you speak of it. There ain't no games or tricks here, no cheatin' and no lyin'. Them trees just stand up natural and strong and clean, like young boys their first time in the ring, before they've learned its rottenness and how to double-cross and lay down to the betting odds and the fight fans. Yes, it is brave. Say, Saxon, you see things, don't you? His pause was almost wistful, and he looked at her and studied her with a caressing softness that ran through her in resurgent thrills. Do you know, I'd just like you to see me fight sometime, a real fight, with something doing every moment. I'd be proud to death to do it for you, and I'd sure fight some with you looking on and understanding. That'd be a fight what is, take it from me. And that's funny, too. I've never wanted to fight before a woman in my life. They squeal and screech and don't understand. But you'd understand. It's dead open and shut you would. A little later, swinging along the flat of the valley, through the little clearings of the farmers, and the ripe grain stretches golden in the sunshine, Billy turned to Saxon again. Say, you've been in love with fellows lots of times. Tell me about it. What is it like? She shook her head slowly. I only thought I was in love, and not many times either. Many times, he cried. Not really, she assured him, secretly exultant at his unconscious jealousy. I was never really in love. If I had been, I'd be married now. You see, I couldn't see anything else to it but to marry a man if I loved him. But suppose he didn't love you. Oh, I don't know, she smiled, half with facetiousness and half with certainty and pride. I think I could make him love me. I guess you sure could, Billy proclaimed enthusiastically. The trouble is, she went on, that the men that loved me I've never cared for that way. Oh, look. A cottontail rabbit had scuttled across the road and a tiny dust cloud lingered like smoke, marking the way of his flight. At the next turn, a dozen quail exploded into the air from under the noses of the horses. Billy and Saxon exclaimed in mutual delight. Gee, he muttered, I almost wished I'd been born a farmer. Folks weren't made to live in cities. Not our kind, at least, she agreed, followed a pause and a long sigh. It's all so beautiful. It would be a dream just to live all your life in it. I'd like to be an Indian squaw sometimes. 
Several times Billy checked himself on the verge of speech. About those fellows you thought you was in love with, he said finally. You ain't told me yet. You want to know, she asked. They didn't amount to anything. Of course I want to know. Go ahead. Fire away. Well, first there was Al Stanley. What did he do for a living, Billy demanded, almost as with authority. He was a gambler. Billy's face abruptly stiffened, and she could see his eyes cloudy with doubt in the quick glance he flung at her. Oh, it was all right, she laughed. I was only eight years old. You see, I'm beginning at the beginning. It was after my mother died when I was adopted by Caddy. He kept a hotel and a saloon. It was down in Los Angeles, just a small hotel. Working men, just common laborers, mostly, and some railroad men stopped at it, and I guess Al Stanley got a share of their wages. He was so handsome and so quiet and soft-spoken, and he had the nicest eyes and the softest, cleanest hands. I can see them now. He played with me sometimes in the afternoons and gave me candy and little presents. He used to sleep most of the day. I didn't know why then. I thought he was a fairy prince in disguise. And then he got killed right in the barroom. But first he killed the man that killed him. So that was the end of that love affair. Next was after the asylum, when I was thirteen and living with my brother. I've lived with him ever since. He was a boy that drove a bakery wagon. Almost every morning on our way to school, I used to pass him. He would come driving down Wood Street and turn in on Twelfth. Maybe it was because he drove a horse that attracted me. Anyway, I must have loved him for a couple of months. Then he lost his job or something, for another boy drove the wagon, and we've never even spoken to each other. Then there was a bookkeeper when I was sixteen. I seemed to run the bookkeepers. It was a bookkeeper at the laundry that Charlie Long beat up. This other one was when I was working in Hickmeyer's cannery. He had soft hands, too, but I quickly got all I wanted of him. He was, well, anyway, he had ideas like your boss, and I never really did love him truly and honest. Billy, I felt from the first he wasn't just right. And when I was working in the paper box factory, I thought I loved the clerk in Kahn's Emporium. You know, on 11th and Washington, he was all right. That was the trouble with him. He was too much all right. He didn't have any life in him, any go. He wanted to marry me, though, but somehow I couldn't see it. That shows I didn't love him. He was narrow-chested and skinny, and his hands were always cold and fishy. But my, he could dress. Just like he came out of a bandbox. He said he was going to drown himself and all kinds of things, but I broke with him just the same. After that, well, there isn't any after that. I must have got particular, I guess, but I didn't see anybody I could love. It seemed more like a game with the men I met or a fight, and we never fought fair on either side. Seemed as if we always had cards up our sleeves. We weren't honest or outspoken, but instead it seemed as if we were trying to take advantage of each other. Charlie Long was honest, though, and so was that bank cashier, and even they made me have the fight feeling harder than ever. And all of them always made me feel I had to take care of myself. They wouldn't, that was sure. She stopped and looked with interest at the clean profile of his face as he watched and guided the horses. He looked at her inquiringly, and her eyes laughed lazily into his as she stretched her arms. That's all, she concluded. I've told you everything, which I've never done before to anyone, and it's your turn now. Not much of a turn, Saxon. I never cared for girls, that is, not enough to want to marry them. I've always liked men better, fellows like Billy Murphy. Besides, I guess I was too interested in training and fighting to bother with women much. Why, Saxon, honest, while I ain't been altogether good, 
You understand what I mean just the same. I ain't never talked love to a girl in my life. There was no call to. The girls have loved you just the same, she teased, while in her heart was a curious elation at his virginal confession. He devoted himself to the horses. Lots of them, she urged. Still he did not reply. Now, haven't they? Well, it wasn't my fault, he said slowly. If they wanted to look sideways at me, it was up to them. And it was up to me to sidestep, if I wanted to, wasn't it? You've no idea, Saxon, how a prize fighter is run after. Why, sometimes it seemed to me that the girls and women ain't got an ounce of natural shame in their makeup. Oh, I was never afraid of them, believe me, but I didn't hanker after them. A man's a fool that lets them kind get his goat. Maybe you haven't got love in you, she challenged. Maybe I haven't, was his discouraging reply. Anyway, I don't see myself loving a girl that runs after me. It's all right for Charlie boys, but a man that is a man don't like being chased by women. My mother always said that love was the greatest thing in the world, Saxon argued. She wrote poems about it, too. Some of them were published in the San Jose Mercury. What do you think about it? Oh, I don't know, she baffled, meeting his eyes with another lazy smile. All I know is it's pretty good to be alive a day like this. On a trip like this, you bet it is, he added promptly. At one o'clock, Billy turned off the road and drove into an open space among the trees. Here's where we eat, he announced. I thought it'd be better to have a lunch by ourselves than to stop at one of these roadside diner counters. And now, just to make everything safe and comfortable, I'm going to unharness the horses. We've got lots of time. You can get the lunch basket out and spread it on the lap robe. As Saxon unpacked the basket, she was appalled at his extravagance. She spread an amazing array of ham and chicken sandwiches, crab salad, hard-boiled eggs, pickled pig's feet, ripe olives and dill pickles, Swiss cheese, salted almonds, oranges and bananas, and several pint bottles of beer. It was the quantity as well as the variety that bothered her. It had the appearance of a reckless attempt to buy out a whole delicatessen shop. You oughtn't to blow yourself that way, she reproved him, as he sat down beside her. Why, it's enough for half a dozen bricklayers. It's all right, isn't it? Yes, she acknowledged, but that's the trouble. It's too much so. Then it's all right, he concluded. I always believe in having plenty. Have some beer to wash the dust away before we begin. Watch out for the glasses. I've got to return them. Later, the meal finished, he lay on his back, smoking a cigarette, and questioned her about her earlier history. She had been telling him of her life in her brother's house, where she paid four dollars and a half a week board. At fifteen, she had graduated from grammar school and gone to work in the jute mills for four dollars a week, three of which she had paid to Sarah. How about that saloon keeper, Billy asked? How come it he adopted you? She shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, except that all my relatives were hard up. It seemed they just couldn't get on. They managed to scratch a lean living for themselves, and that was all. Caddy, he was the saloon keeper, had been a soldier in my father's company, and he always swore by Captain Kit, which was their nickname for him. My father had kept the surgeons from amputating his leg in the war, and he never forgot it. He was making money in the hotel and saloon. I found out afterward that he helped out a lot to pay the doctors and to bury my mother alongside a father. I was to go to Uncle Will, that was my mother's wish, but there had been fighting up in the Ventura Mountains, where his ranch was, and men had been killed. It was about fences and cattlemen or something, and anyway he was in jail a long time. And when he got his freedom, the lawyers had got his ranch. He was an old man then, and broken, and his wife took sick, and he got a job as night watchman for forty dollars a month. 
so he couldn't do anything for me, and Caddy adopted me. Caddy was a good man if he did run a saloon. His wife was a big, handsome-looking woman. I don't think she was all right, and I've heard so since. But she was good to me. I don't care what they say about her or what she was. She was awfully good to me. After he died, she went altogether bad, and so I went into the orphan asylum. It wasn't any too good there, and I had three years of it. And then Tom married and settled down to steady work, and he took me out to live with him. And, well, I've been working pretty steady ever since. She gazed sadly away across the fields until her eyes came to rest on a fence, bright, splashed, with poppies at its base. Billy, who from his supine position had been looking up at her, studying and pleasuring in the pointed oval of her woman's face, reached his hand out slowly as he murmured, You poor little kid. His hand closed sympathetically on her bare forearm, and as she looked down to greet his eyes, she saw in them surprise and delight. Say, ain't your skin cool, though, he said. Now me, I'm always warm. Feel my hand. It was warmly moist, and she noted microscopic beads of sweat on his forehead and clean-shaven upper lip. My, but you are sweaty. She bent to him and with her handkerchief dabbed his lip and forehead dry, then dried his palms. I breathe through my skin, I guess, he explained. The wise guys in the training camps and gyms says it's a good sign of health. But somehow, I'm sweating more than usual now. Funny, ain't it? She had been forced to unclasp his hand from her arm in order to dry it, and when she finished, it returned to its old position. But say, ain't your skin cool, he repeated, with renewed wonder. Soft as velvet, too and smooth as silk. It feels great. Gently explorative, he slid his hand from wrist to elbow and came to rest halfway back. Tired and languid from the morning in the sun, she found herself thrilling to his touch and half dreamily deciding that here was a man she could love, hands and all. Now I've taken the cool all out of that spot. He did not look up to her, and she could see the roguish smile that curled on his lips. So I guess I'll try another. He shifted his hand along her arm with soft sensuousness, and she, looking down at his lips, remembered the long tingling they had given hers the first time they had met. Go on and talk, he urged, after a delicious five minutes of silence. I like to watch your lips talking. It's funny, but every move they make looks like a tickly kiss. Greatly, she wanted to stay where she was. Instead, she said, If I talk, you won't like what I say. Go on, he insisted. You can't say anything I won't like. Well, there's some poppies over there by the fence I want to pick, and then it's time for us to be going. I lose, he laughed. But you made twenty-five tickle kisses just the same. I've counted them. I tell you what, you sing when the harvest days are over and let me have your other cool arm while you're doing it and then we'll go. She sang looking down into his eyes, which were centered not on hers but on her lips. When she finished, she slipped his hands from her arm and got up. He was about to start for the horses when she held her jacket out to him. Despite the independence natural to a girl who earned her own living, she had an innate love of the little services and finesses, and also she remembered from her childhood the talk by the pioneer women of the courtesy and attendance of the caballeros of the Spanish California days. Sunset greeted them when, after a wide circle to the east and south, they cleared the divide of the Contra Costa Hills and began dropping down the long grade that led past Redwood Park to Fruitvale. Beneath them stretched the flatlands to the bay, checkerboarded into fields, and broken by the towns of Elmhurst, San Leandro, and Haywards. The smoke of Oakland 
filled the western sky with haze and murk, while beyond, across the bay, they could see the first winking lights of San Francisco. Darkness was on them, and Billy had become curiously silent. For half an hour he had given no recognition of her existence save once, when the chill evening which caused him to tuck the robe tightly about her and himself. Half a dozen times Saxon felt herself on the verge of the remark, What's on your mind? But each time let it remain unuttered. She sat very close to him, the warmth of their bodies intermingled, and she was aware of a great restfulness and content. Say, Saxon, he began abruptly, it's no use me holding it in any longer. It's been in my mouth all day, ever since lunch. What's the matter with you and me getting married? She knew very quietly and very gladly that he meant it. Instinctively, she was impelled to hold off, to make him woo her, to make herself more desirably valuable ere she yielded. Further, her woman's sensitiveness and pride were offended. She had never dreamed of so forthright and bald a proposal from the man to whom she would give herself. The simplicity and directness of Billy's proposal constituted almost a hurt. On the other hand, she wanted him so much, how much she had not realized until now, when he had so unexpectedly made himself accessible. Well, you gotta say something, Saxon. Hand it to me, good or bad, but anyway hand it to me, and just take into consideration that I love you. Why, I love you like the very devil, Saxon. I must, because I'm asking you to marry me, and I never asked any girl that before. Another silence fell, and Saxon found herself dwelling on the warmth, tingling now under the lap robe. When she realized whither her thoughts led, she blushed guiltily in the darkness. How old are you, Billy? she questioned, with a suddenness and irrelevance as disconcerting as his first words had been. Twenty-two, he answered. I am twenty-four. As if I didn't know. When you left the orphan asylum, and how old you were. How long you worked in the jute mills, the cannery, the paper box factory, the laundry. Maybe you think I can't do addition. I knew how old you was, even to your birthday. That doesn't change the fact that I'm two years older. What of it? If it counted for anything, I wouldn't be loving you, would I? Your mother was dead right. Love's the big stuff. It's what counts, don't you see? I just love you, and I've got to have you. It's natural, I guess. And I've always found with horses, dogs, and other folks that what's natural is right. There's no getting away from it, Saxon. I got to have you, and I'm just hoping hard you've got to have me. Maybe my hands ain't soft like bookkeepers and clerks, but they can work for you and fight like Sam Hill for you, and Saxon, they can love you. The old sex antagonism, which she had always experienced with men, seemed to have vanished. She had no sense of being on the defensive. This was no game. It was what she had been looking for and dreaming about. Before Billy, she was defenseless, and there was an all-satisfaction in the knowledge. She could deny him nothing, not even if he proved to be like the others. And out of the greatness of the thought rose a greater thought. He would not so prove himself. She did not speak. Instead, in a glow of spirit and flesh, she reached out to his left hand and gently tried to remove it from the rain. He did not understand, but when she persisted, he shifted the rein to his right hand and let her have her will with the other hand. Her head bent over it, and she kissed the teamster's calluses. For a moment he was stunned. You mean it, he stammered. For reply, she kissed the hand again and murmured, I love your hands, Billy. To me, they are the most beautiful hands in the world, and it would take hours of talking to tell you all they mean to me. Oh, he called to the horses. He pulled them into a standstill, soothed them with his voice, 
and made the reins fast around the whip. Then he turned to her, with arms around her, and lips to lips. Oh, Billy, I'll make you a good wife, she sobbed, when the kiss was broken. He kissed her wet eyes and found her lips again. Now you know what I was thinking and why I was sweating when we was eating lunch. Just seemed I couldn't hold it in much longer from telling you. Why, you know, you looked good to me from the first moment I spotted you. And I think I loved you from the first day, too, Billy. And I was so proud of you all that day. You were so kind and gentle and so strong. And the way men all respected you and the girls all wanted you. And the way you fought those three Irishmen when I was behind the picnic table. I couldn't love or marry a man I wasn't proud of. And I'm so proud of you, so proud. Not half as much as I am right now of myself, he answered, for having won you. It's too good to be true. Maybe the alarm clock will go off and wake me up in a couple of minutes. Well, anyway, if it does, I'm going to make the best of them two minutes first. Watch out, I don't eat you. I'm that hungry for you. He smothered her in an embrace, holding her so tightly to him that it almost hurt. After what was to her an age-long period of bliss, his arms relaxed, and he seemed to make an effort to draw himself together. And the clock ain't gone off yet, he whispered against her cheek, and it's a dark night, and there's fruit veil right ahead, and if there ain't king and prince standing still in the middle of the road. I never thought the time had come when I wouldn't want to take the ribbons on a fine pair of horses. But this is that time. I just can't let go of you. And I've got us some time tonight. It hurts worse than poison. But here goes. He restored her to herself, tucked the disarranged robe about her, and chirped to the impatient team. Half an hour later he called, Whoa! I know I'm awake now, but I don't know but maybe I dreamed all the rest, and I just want to make sure. And again, he made the reins fast and took her in his arms. End of section 11